only for the distant future and which meant from the first century you got to wait a thousand two thousand years and then uh, you can see the things happening but remember the book of Revelation really opens up with a very direct statement this is the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave to him to show to his servants of whom even the angel of uh, Revelation 19 and 22 say, I'm just a servant who have to keep the words of this prophecy, right? So right there and then, even the angel who was showing the visions to John had to keep the words of the prophecy. So the revelation of Jesus Christ, or the disclosure, the unveiling of things that are shortly to come to pass, that God sent through his servant. All right? Jesus and Jesus sent through his servant, the angel, the angel sent through the servant of Jesus, John, and then to the churches. So we must remember the context is, yes, it's in the future, but it was in the future of the people to whom the letter was first addressed. And their future was very soon things shortly to come to pass. So it was future for them. And God had to help them to understand urgently, the servants of God, urgently, what was going to happen very fast. So it's their future and it's our past. We're looking back because they were standing here and things are about to happen to pass and things happen. And then all the rest is future. But we can also say, of course, we can study the book of Revelation meaningfully because our future is in Christ. Right? If we are not in Christ, we have no future. So only in that sense, so from the book of Revelation begins to instruct us how do we live our future in Christ in every generation that we are in Christ. So the book of Revelation is in fact a very important book of instruction of how we are to live in the reality of Christ, of the very body of God that is placed upon earth as God's kingdom. Let's first pick up this temple image uh, most powerfully presented by the Lord Jesus because he came into the temple of Jerusalem right at the Jewish Passover. Now in the book of Revelation, you will come across 29 times the use of the word lamb, and 28 times it's referring to Jesus as the Lamb of God. The same word anion that appears only once elsewhere in John 21 when Jesus said, feed my lamb, right? In John 1, the Lamb of God, that's a different word, amnos, but this is anion. So Jesus appears as the very Lamb that Peter had to feed. In words, he, he himself did not show himself mostly as the line of tribe of Judah. He did show himself once. He did show himself clearly in Revelation 19 as the rider as, as a king of kings on the horse, but he showed himself 28 times as the lamb that needed to be fed. And that's very important. It's one of the important symbols in there. The lamb gained its greatest prominence at Passover. True, you can sacrifice a goat on the 14th day of Nisan, or a lamb, but most of the time, and down the centuries, they picked a lamb. And for good reason, because in Exodus 29, we are told of the morning and evening sacrifices, they are lambs. And so the Passover became, began to be associated primarily with the lamb. And you see the lamb in the book of Leviticus, the, the, all the different uh, moments, you, you see it as the presented as a burnt offering or as a uh, guilt offering or as a sin offering in different moments. But it did not occupy the center stage like the bull or the goats of the <clears throat> Day of Atonement. 
So it's as though that the lamb is all over the place, but mostly the lamb is associated with Passover. Now the book of Revelation is also talking about the passing over of God into the community of the people of God under old covenant Israel and coming into new covenant Israel standing. And so it's a Passover in which God is going to separate between those who truly are going to participate of the Lamb, to eat of the Lamb, eat wholly of the Lamb, like that Passover night in Exodus 12. And those who are not, those who are the opposite, those who are against the Lamb, and those who participate with the Lamb. And so the book of Revelation, you can say, is a big Passover. And you see how this lamb and its followers were delivered and passed over the angel of death, and the others were not. So these pictures are there. Now, at this Jewish Passover, we are told Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, the book of Revelation centers on Jerusalem. And right in chapter 11, it is spiritually Sodom and Egypt, right? We're told. And the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, we are told yeah, Jerusalem has become Sodom, right? So it is also focused on Jerusalem. And oh, how about the temple courts? And we will be looking at Revelation 11, 1 again, how the temple is being measured for the worshippers and the altar. And the ones in the temple courts, they are with the nations of the world and being trampled down. But Jesus came into the temple of Jerusalem at Jewish Passover, and he found and they've just been eating the lamb at home, right? Every one of them. And he found people selling cattle, sheep, doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. So we know the temple is the house of the Father. It's a very important piece of information. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Again, the house of God. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to, all, to do all this? What sign? And we will come to this right uh, promptly. What sign? Jesus said, this is the sign. Destroy this temple and I will raise it up again in three days. They replied, it's taken 46 years to build a temple. That's when Herod the Great began to do major extensions and renovations 46 years before this day on the second temple. And so they were wondering, how could you raise up in three days? They were thinking not spiritually, they were thinking physically. But the temple he had spoken of was his body. And that's another very important information. Think of the temple of God, the temple of the Father as the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Now while he was in where Jerusalem when at the Passover, many people saw the signs he was doing and believed in his name. And you find that in the Gospel of John, the big miracles 
of Jesus changing water into wine and uh, all the other ones raising Lazarus out of the tomb, they are called signs. In other words, they are signifying something greater and it became a symbol, a sign of a much greater reality. So let's come to the book of Revelation, which is a huge Passover event, you can say, and look at the Lamb of God and how in the very first verse we are told the revelation of Jesus Christ and 28 times he's shown as the Lamb in there, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must surely come to pass and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. The Aramaic also translates it very well, or at least from their own uh, Peshitta, Aramaic Peshitta, the Bible that uh, I know Elizabeth has. <laughs> uh, um, it also translates it very well. The revelation of Yeshua the Messiah, which God gave to him to show his servants what had been given to soon occur, and he symbolized it when he sent by his angel to his servant, Yohanan. And I've placed another two, the two most popular English translations, the New International Version and the English Standard Version there. And they translated that key phrase, the signing, the semino, into he made it known. which is unfortunate because you totally lose that signing part of the Gospel of John, the many signs that he shown, and also the book of Revelation, the sign. What were the signs? There was a sign in the sky and another sign and yet another sign and yet another sign. Well, those are the most direct signs, but then all across the book of Revelation, you see symbol after symbol after symbol. And one of the most, you can say, overarching symbol is God's temple. Right? God's temple. For those who are reading the book of Revelation for the first, second, third, maybe tenth time, maybe you still didn't get the overarching presence of the temple. It's all over the place in every chapter, directly and indirectly. But let's understand what is God's temple. There are three main truths that we must really understand. The Bible shows us the temple is the residence of God. God's physical presence is in there. Exodus 40, when everything was set up in accordance to God's instruction by Moses, the glory cloud, the Shekinah of the Lord came into the temple. When King Solomon built the Jerusalem temple in accordance to what David had given, which he received blueprints from heaven and he was dedicating that the glory cloud came into the temple so the priests could hardly know what's going on they couldn't really get it and, and sort things out the very presence of God dwelt there the same glorious presence the Shekinah cloud that Ezekiel later on see leave the temple the temple is the earthly address of the Almighty. And that's why he told the people of Israel while in the wilderness, I will go and bring you to the place where I'm going to put my presence. And in that place you will come three times a year, all you grown-up males. I don't expect every single family, but just a 
grown up males 20 and over you have to come and not come empty handed come to show me that you have been producing fruit that you are grown up that you are mature so at passover at pentecost at tabernacles come come there with your gifts to me as a grown up in my family as a grown up child in my family why because that's the house of god that's where god can and must be met for the few thousand years that the physical temple starting with the tabernacle in the wilderness was established now the body of christ is a temple so remember when we come do we come desperate for his presence do we come with the knowledge that he is here that every word spoken to me you know when i speak the words of the bible to you not just a book of revelation when i sound it out and you hear you can only hear because you receive the air that i breathed out right you could not hear if the air that i breathed out did not travel into you so that's the breath and if that is the word of god that is the breath of god it's entering into you the holy word is the breath of god and so we come longing for the word of god when we come into the house of god we come into the presence of god now the temple all through the bible it's also the court of god it's where god holds judgment holds counsel and he shows forth his power judgment and mercy righteousness and truth comes out from that presence of god there's located you can say in the heavenlies in the court of god where all those who are worthy to be with him in counsel they can begin to pronounce and begin to magnify god's presence on the earth through specific acts of power and authority and judgments so we find the ancient prophets the old testament prophets like jeremiah taken into the council law and pronounced judgment or ezekiel you can see that or isaiah go and tell those people they shall always be seeing but not perceiving hearing and not understanding and they will not be given to repent and they will this judgment will go on until the whole city is ruined and destroyed you see that where was isaiah he was taken up into the very court of heaven isaiah 6 into the temple of god because we see that powerfully also in the book of revelation and then the third aspect the worship of god by his people is at the temple there used to be and it started with that worship was carried out only the real worship was carried out only at the temple at the tabernacle the tabernacle is made of tent material and later on it's made of the stones and all that that's temple so tabernacle movable temple and the physical temple when they came into the temple then they can serve god how how it's because only at the temple can you come to the altar the altar of the burnt sacrifice in which not only burnt sacrifices the ola but also the grain sacrifice the mincha and also the peace sacrifice the shalamin and also the guilt offering the asham and the sin offering the khatat these five main offerings can be served only at the altar and that service god's purpose in calling for himself a people is so as to 
serve him and by serving him declare his praises forever and ever. You are a holy generation. You are a chosen generation, a holy people belonging to God. And you have been delivered out of darkness into his marvelous light to bring praise to him, to bring service to him, to make it all work. Without that service at the temple, there is no worship. And that's why we need to understand and be reminded of the services performed at the altar. If we don't participate in the burnt offering, grain offering, the fellowship offering, the sin offering, the guilt offering, then we are not giving service to the Lord that is primary to the temple. If we think we're just coming to sing some songs and that's serving God, then we have totally missed the whole point of bringing worship to God. Now, because it is the residence of God, because it is the court of God, because it is the place of the worship of God by his people, so where God lives, where God rules, where God is worshipped, is holy. And so that's why uh, we find when Moses came before the presence of the angel of the Lord who carries the presence of God. Now, the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is a messenger who carries the presence of the Lord God. That's an amazing thing. It's a messenger, an angelic personality who carries the very presence, the name of the Lord God. And that's why when you come to the New Testament, uh, Paul saying that, you know, the word was, the word of God in the Old Testament was mediated through angels, right? Was sent by angels. You have to understand that it was the angel of the Lord. And yes, when that angel of the Lord carries the presence of the Lord, Moses or whoever so must bow down, must kneel. And he says, this place is holy. Please remove your shoes. You have to come without the trappings of this world and come and plant your feet squarely upon the holy presence of God. Habakkuk 6.3, holy, holy, holy. Or rather, Isaiah 6, 3, holy, holy, holy. This is the Lord of hosts. The whole world is full of his glory. <coughs> Something we see echoed very powerfully also in the book of Revelation. And Habakkuk 2, 20, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Habakkuk, there was a lot of noise. Habakkuk's mind was, the prophet was so filled with troubles because he saw that God was going to bring the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, to come in and judge the nation that belonged to God, which is even more holy than, than these ones. And he sees all that. And so there's a lot of noise in him and all around then we are told, keep quiet. Show your reverential fear. The Lord will decide. The Lord will still all things and bring all things into their proper place. And so that's why the book of Habakkuk ends with, you know, he climbing higher, the prophet climbing higher to Make sure that, thank you, that even though he does not see grapes on the vine, he does not see the olive crops, he does not see any cattle in the store, he does not see anything, even th although all hope is lost as far as the physical immediate future is concerned for the people of God. He said, yet I will hope in God my salvation and I will climb higher like the mountain goat, higher and declare that salvation, my hope is in God, because He is all my future that I need. When we come into the house of God, we have everything that we need. 
So the song that uh, is that that was very very popular some 15 20 years ago this is holy ground we're standing on holy ground for the lord is present and where he is is holy do we know that when we come here this is holy ground we're standing on holy ground for the Lord is present, and where he is, is holy. Now, if the Lord is not present, because this is not his temple, then it doesn't matter. But if the Lord can live here at Jam, or at any place, congregation, church, assembly, and where he can rule from and out of, and where he is truly served, then it's holy. We are standing on holy ground. And I know that there are angels all around. Let us praise Jesus now. We are standing in his presence on holy ground. And that's why when we come, especially in a context of a worship service, we must come with that reverential awe, respect. And uh, so that's why we try to keep everything quiet. And even if kind of service is officially ended, it's really still the service so you quietly move out from this place and you know go to the kitchen or elsewhere and while the rest of the people are soaking in prayer or so this reflects our understanding of the presence of the lord he may want to speak to one person or another person or the whole group other things and so we don't just you know disrupt this but we keep silent before him so these are things and attitudes and actions that we must understand when we are in God's house in his temple in his presence so the three very important truths God's temple God's is God's house is God's court is God's place where he receives his service. You can say it's the place where he sits down and enjoy a good meal. Right? So this is his home. Now we're just going to quickly uh, look through the direct temple references in the book of Revelation. There are scores of others which are indirect allusions, right? Even uh, in chapter 1, John heard a voice behind him, and when he turned around, what did he see? He saw these lamb stands, right? So he's placed right into a temple scene, and how does Jesus appear? He appears like dressed like a priest, a high priest. So those are indirect uh, illusions, but they are clearly temple seen. So in 3.12, the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Now this would not make sense if you're thinking literally. You have to think symbolically. To the Philadelphian Christian, a Christian who is true to the word of God, who truly loves the brethren, who truly is a Jew in the eyes of God. God will make him someone very important in this temple. To be a pillar in this body means that you are someone that God has placed there to lend strength to the whole building. Now, can 
all of us here be pillars? Of course, because we're not talking about physical dwelling place. At least not only, we are talking about a spiritual dwelling place. And the stronger, the more the pillars that God established here, the stronger this whole temple is. Or you can say the higher the authority this place is. So yes, we aspire to be the Church of Philadelphia. In fact, we have been called the Church of Philadelphia. And so every one of us should want to take your place within this place of the body of Christ. Everyone, it's going to be a Boaz, it's going to be a Jakin, the strength that God establishes like the two pillars before Solomon's temple, right? You're going to carry strength, you're going to carry God's establishment, Everyone can be distinct. Every one of us can be distinct. You can be very quiet behind, you know, doing something, or you can be very vocal up front, or you can be anywhere in between. You can be a pillar of God. Now, Revelation 7, 15. Brother Hank brought out a very important point. The nations of the world now can come into the family of God before the throne of God. Not just the 12 tribes of Israel, but the 12,000 tribes of the world. Or even the 120,000 ethnic tribes of the world. Doesn't matter. They all can come in now. We all now come in before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. So whether you're in Timbuktu or in Tibet, right? In Shanghai, in Singapore, in Vancouver, or wherever. If you have come in with the Lamb, you have the mark of God. You have been called by God to be a part of His house. You can worship Him day and night. You can serve Him wherever you are. You can serve Him. His altar is right here. His altar is right in your home. His altar is right where you are because you are connected into the spiritual body of God. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. And you are under the watchful presence of God because you are in the temple. Now, if you are outside the temple, it's a different story. You're going to be trampled by the values of the world, the philosophies of the world, that all the other values, ideas of the world. But when you're inside, God's presence watches over you. He watches your sitting down, your rising up. He watches your going out or staying in. Psalm 139. Revelation 11, we will look into greater detail. I was given a measuring rod like a staff. I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there, but exclude the courtyard of the temple. And then we have Revelation 11, 19, temple being opened and that covenant, which means we are entering into this new covenant, really. And this authoritative flashes of lightning rumblings. Revelation 14, another scene of the reaping of the harvest. And the angel came out of the temple. So we see in the book of Revelation the coming out from the temple. All right? So, and then Revelation 14, 17, again, we have that out of the temple. And then 15, he saw again that the tabernacle of the covenant law, and it was opened. And 15.6, out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues. And verse 8, the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God. 16.1, I heard a loud voice from the temple. 
the authority point, ruling out of that. Go, now pour out the seven bowls. And 1617, the seventh angel pour out the bowl, uh, and uh, the seventh angel poured out the bowl unto the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice. It is done. The indirect reference, a loud voice coming out of the altar, you can see. You know, from the altar came voices and all that. So, but the direct reference is here. And 21, 22, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. So we see how prevailing it is. Now the first image of the temple was in the temple garden of Genesis 2. How do we see that? Well, you can see that in the tree of life and the river. And in Ezekiel 47, you see the tree, trees of life growing by the river that leads into the Dead Sea that became alive. And it, the river came from under the throne of God. We have cherubim guarding the entrance. On the mercy seat, there are cherubim. And, you know, there are, it is the presence of God. Where God is, is holy. So when they fell into disobedience and they violated that, they were banished out of the holy presence of God. So we know that there is a temple garden scene. And so at the beginning of the Bible and then at the end, the book of Revelation, right the last chapter, we see the temple garden of Revelation 22. John saw that there's one tree of life and there are 12 different seasons of fruit. Every month, a season, you can say, and the leaves are for the healing of the nations. Only who is holy, who has been washed by the blood of the Lamb, can be inside this temple city. It's a city, temple, garden city, much larger than Eden. But outside are those who commit all kinds of things or are caught in all kinds of things, sorcery, murder, lying. They don't belong there. And that's why every time we part part participate in those things, of sorcery, of adultery, of lying, of whatever, we are technically shutting ourselves out or being banished, at least for those times when we are unrepentant from the presence of God. And if we carry an attitude that is unrepentant, we have always stayed outside the presence of God. This is something that sometimes Christians don't understand. Some Christians carry unrepentant attitudes for years and years and years and years. When we carry that, it means that we were never in the presence of God. Really, in, that, in the sense that God wants us to be in His presence. So this is a very serious thing. Now, we see the temple or the tabernacle in the wilderness. And of course, later on, we see the, <clears throat> the temple and Solomon's dedication there. The glory cloud of God came in. And in John chapter 2, we see the glory clothed in human flesh. The glory clothed in human flesh come into the temple to bring destruction. Jesus was destroying the things there that were supposedly to serve God, but they were serving the interests and the hearts of man. The holy presence of God is holy and Jesus meant that as a signing, that as a picture of the destruction. And he said that take this temple down. And in fact, he would take this temple down in AD 70, just like he did in 586 BC. He took that temple down. We have Ezekiel's vision of the new temple city of God where the altar is right in the heart of the whole piece of temple ground, the altar. All right, we look at Revelation 11. 
Again, we have been looking at this chapter because it seems to bring all the temple imagery together. It begins with the temple, it closes with the temple in heaven being seen. And uh, so, and it also situates the city of Jerusalem and it also uh, situates the two lampstand, or you can say the faithful ones that shine. And it is a picture, you can say, most di directly symbolically of Jesus and John the Baptist and who carry, who walk in the fullness of authority, who can shut up heaven or who can um, uh, make it rain fire because they walked in covenant faithfulness. So they are powerful pictures of what happens within this temple and the conflict that this temple has with those that are around who don't share the values of this temple. And there was given me a measuring rod like a staff. And someone said, get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. And leave out the, the court, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations that they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months three and a half years. And uh, in a very, very real historical sense, for three and a half years, the city of Jerusalem was besieged. It was bes besieged by Rome. And much destruction, an ever-increasing destruction happened within that city of Jerusalem. But very importantly, we are told that God takes an interest in measuring this particular temple at this particular time that was immediately to come to pass. Because he was establishing the temple of his body and the temple of stones had to be taken down. And the temple of human imagination, the temple of wrong traditions, the temple of power-hungry religionists had to be destroyed. And John had to prophesy in end of chapter 10, we are told, he had to eat the words, right? Eat the direction of the words of God. The mystery of God is about to be fulfilled, as told to the prophet. It's raising up that body of the Lord Jesus Christ. The city where God and the Lamb are its temple and the people its light. The part of that temple. And so God is measuring right here those who would belong inside his house and those who should be outside. And that's why you'll find these strange terms. To measure the house of God, the temple, the holy area of God, and the altar, very important, because from the time of Ezekiel, he saw that this re-sized and re-situated, uh, re-designed uh, temple with the altar right in the middle the living altar, and you don't see the ark of God, but you see the altar right in the middle. And so he's seeing a prophetic picture of what's happening. All the service at the temple is focused into the middle of the temple, is at the altar, and we have uh, meditated much on that, as the altar, as where the Lord Jesus Christ, you can see, was raised on the cross, and now all service comes through Jesus and at the cross, which is the eternal altar of God. When we come and have our life married to Jesus, when we come with our sacrifices to Jesus, when we come for our sin offering, for our trespass offering, when we come to have our peace fellowship, to have our grain uh, fellowship offering, and to have the burnt uh, sweet savor sacrifice offering, we come to the Lord Jesus. 
as the house of God and the altar. If we have no altar in our life, it's because we don't have Jesus at the center where we can serve him as servants. If we are serving our own interest, even when coming to church, we are not still servants of God. This is a very important distinction. Those who serve own interests, those who are just trying to be happy for themselves, to be satisfied, to want to come to church so that I can listen good things to make me feel happy, you're still not a servant of God. You are a servant of some good values, maybe. You are a servant of, you know, some wonderful emotions, but you're not a servant of God. When you're a servant of God, when you come and you begin to serve at the altar, you have a relationship with the altar. You don't just come around the altar and just do nothing. And that's what many, 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 unfortunately, members of the nominal, by name only, of the church do. You do almost nothing except criticize, except find fault, except give more burdens, right? <laughs> except you want more from God. But what do you want more from God when you can't give the little that God asks of us? So some of the songs that we sing, sometimes we have to take a few steps back. Okay, you sing, you want more and more of God. <laughs> but how can you have more of God? When you are giving hardly anything of yourself, you have more of God, the more you give, the more you receive, right? So when we come in, into this fellowship, the house of God, the more you give, the more you are going to receive. And you can give in so many different ways. And it's a joy to give. It's not a burden. The commandments of God are not burdensome but they are joyful. That's what John said. He measured the temple. He can speak authoritatively out of his own experience, out of his own obedience to the Lord and his serving of the body of Christ. And those who worship in it, and those who, they don't come to the altar and kneel down and bow down to the altar. That way they come and begin to break the sacrifices at the altar. Now, God wanted John to measure this temple, not because God really is interested in the architecture of it all or the, you know, the precise uh, physical measurements, but he wants to measure those who belong to it. And that's why he can measure up the worshippers. How much of a measure are we as a servant of God is how much of a worshiper at the altar in the temple of God we are. That's how God measures us. But unfortunately, outside, many are found outside, you will be trampled by the nations of the world. So Christians who don't get measured into the temple with the altar because they are not serving at the altar in the temple, they are being trampled outside. Now we see in the first tabernacle, the layout facing east. So you see the, the entrance of this, they face east. We have at the bottom of the screen there from the entrance, you have the big altar of burnt sacrifice and then you have the a laver of washing, you, the priest who can enter into the holy place called the sanctuary where the priest can perform additional service, not just at the bronze burnt altar, but he goes in, he can perform a few other services, right? And the three main things in there will be on the left side as he goes in, there will be the lampstand, and then on the right side across, there will be the table of showbread. And in the middle, just sitting before the, uh, 
the inner sanctuary or the holy of holies. So remember the holy place and then the holy of holies and outside the altar of sacrifice, right? So the holy place, the holy of holies, or you call it the sanctuary or the inner sanctuary. And of course, beyond the veil, which separates the holy place and the holy of holies, you have the uh, mercy seat sitting on top of the ark of the testimony or ark of the covenant. So that's inside the most holy place, right? So there are seven key items that you see, right? The mercy seat sitting on the ark. These are two separate, you can see things. The mercy seat is like the throne seat. And then the ark contains the testimony. The ark contains supposedly originally the the Ten Commandments and some manna and uh, Aaron's rod that budded, but it got lost. But <laughs> anyhow, uh, those are all powerful signs and symbols for us. But we want to uh, help us to understand our relationship with the altar today because many of us still not grappling it sufficiently. We have covered in great detail the five main services at the altar of the worshipper of God. Right? When we come to the altar, there are five sacrifices, and now the altar is Jesus. If we are to be servants and bringing worship, then we have to participate in all these five main sacrifices or offerings, right? So the burnt offering, the grain offering, the sin offering, the guilt offering, the peace offering. So make sure we get this, because if we don't get this, then we are not much good as worshippers, right? We come to church year in and year out and for one year or 10 years or 50 years and we don't even get what the service at the altar is, then how can we be found by God? Jesus came to Shechem, to the well of Jacob, and announced to the Samaritan women that God is not looking at the physical temple of Jerusalem for worship, purse, for servants. He is not looking right here in the valley of Shechem or up on Mount Gerizim where the Samaritans had built a temple which was destroyed by the Jews a couple a hundred years before Christ walked there. And they're still wanting the very presence of God on that mountain or on both holy mountains. But says God says, Jesus says, look, the time is coming and even now is that God is looking for servants who can come to give real worship in spirit and in truth. That means they can connect with me, with my holy presence in spirit. The spirit of God, all through the Bible, you can say 99% of the time is talking about the very word, the very breath of God. That's what it is. The Spirit of God, when He comes into a person, they begin to speak the words of God. Right? The breath of God begins to come forth. How are you filled with the Spirit of God? When the very Word of God fills you. And if it fills you in such a way that it becomes a living Word in you, then you truly are a Spirit-filled person. Not temporarily like those 70 elders, leaders in Numbers uh, chapter uh, uh, 11, or like King Saul, before he was a king even, he was filled with the Spirit temporarily and he began to prophesy and after that it's no more. Or like Samson, he was filled with the power, the Spirit of God, as long as he keeps his hair. And if he cuts his hair, it's no more. Not that way anymore, because in Christ, in the covenant, 
that God establishes forever and ever for the people of His new covenant established by the blood of Christ is different. So you've got to come. We've all got to come to this place of coming to the burnt offering. The burnt offering relates to who we are created in the image of God and in the likeness of God. And that's why uh, in the uh, offering, we see a picture of coming totally washed outside and inside and opened up and the skin given to the anointed priest who carries out the, the service. So it means that we come as priests. We come as priests. So when we come to the body of Christ or to any part of the body of Christ, we must have this outer garment to clothe someone, just like God clothed Adam after Adam and Eve were exposed. So God clothed them. And so we carry this attitude of serving the Lord as a priest by coming here. We are here to cover up one another. Jesus told the disciples in uh, John 13, as he bent down, stripped himself half naked and washed the disciples' feet, said, I've already washed you guys clean. You don't need the whole body. I've already bathed you guys. You are in me. So, But I need to wash your feet because it's the feet that get dirty. And so when we come to the body of Christ, we are all washed clean by the Lord, but we still trample on dirt and we walk into some paths that are wrong. And so we need one another to wash our sins, to cover up, to clean us and cover us. It's not The church is not a place... We don't serve God when we are just trying to expose people's weaknesses and, and shame them. No. It's a place where you're serving as a priest. You take off yourself that cold skin and cover another priest. That's in the burnt offering. And because of that, and you're willing to give yourself wholly, and the inside of you that have touched some dung, like the animal, some dirt of the world, and extreme dirt of of some animals or behavior, they are washed away and then it is burnt fully, totally consecrated with God. So that's the burnt offering. So come to the body of Christ as a worshiper carrying a priestly mindset. You are carrying the image of God. Just like Aaron, when he comes into the presence of God, he has to have a name unto the Lord holy unto the Lord. He's fully given to the Lord. So we come in the book of Revelation with the name of God on our forehead. It is holy, separated, belonging holy to God. That's the burnt offering. So we come with that understanding in the body of Christ, in the church. Thank you. All right, so remember, when we come as priests, and when we come giving ourselves wholly to the Lord, we are bringing service to God. But we come with anything that opposes that, we are doing the opposite of serving God. So we come to make God really pleased. Right? The grain offering speaks of clearly the covenant. We come into the place of a covenant relationship with God. And that's why in the, in the uh, grain offering, and you can see that very powerfully in Leviticus chapter 2, you come as you are, and sometimes the grain is prepared this way. There are three different ways they are prepared and brought before the Lord, this grain offering. But it, it is the offering where salt is added into it because it establishes that as a long-lasting, in fact, everlasting covenant. A covenant of salt means that that covenant, that contract cannot be broken. And that's what we see in the grain offering. You can bring the first fruits to this grain offering as part of this grain offering. So what does it speak of? As our covenant standing, as the children of God, and as the children who will begin to listen and understand the ways of the Lord and being faithful 
to learning Him. And so frankincense is also brought in. You can begin to produce extra, other extraordinary, uh, this, this sense of God. You begin to, to, to come into a place of discipleship of God, of Jesus, where you are carrying the fragrance, the aroma of God, like what Paul says, right? It's an aroma for life to those who are inside. An aroma speaking of the deaf condition of the rest of the people who don't have this, right? So it brings reward, it brings judgment, this sense. So covenant standing, that's why Jesus told the disciples that if the salt loses its saltiness, what value is it? In other words, if it's not real salt, it will lose its saltiness. And he spoke that in the context of calling disciples into this place of fully dedicating themselves to following him, to loving him, and being willing to learn all kinds of lessons, even taking up the cross. So when we come to the house of God, we come to the altar, why are we diligently studying and learning and producing what we learn by bringing out the first fruit, the very likeness of God. You know, what is first fruit? The first fruits are the fruits that appear for the first time that year. So it brings out what is inside the tree. What is the most important thing inside the tree? It brings it out. And so the church where we serve God, we serve God by showing that we have matured with offerings. We have matured with the, the real likeness of God in ways that people can taste, that can smell through the frankincense, and pe that, that is good and lasting, like in the salt. So we see all that in the grain offering. So we come as disciples of Christ, as students of Christ in the church, as those who learn how to keep covenant. And to keep covenant, we have to understand covenant. Why are we studying the Old Covenant, Old Testament, and the New Covenant, New Testament? Because we are breaking the grain offering. And so if I resist wanting to learn about the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, the heart of God, that means I'm not serving God in this offering. We must grasp this knowledge. That's why it's important. If we are going to be a worshiper, that must be part of who we are. And the third offering listed here is the sin offering. Now, we still live with the effects of sin, right? Or we still live under sin condition. Even the Lord Jesus was caught in that situation. By right, he should not be offering in Matthew 17, the, the silver coin that's enough for him and Peter to the temple authorities. That violated some truth. But he says in order not to just create a stir, just go and just throw your hook into the, the lake and then just pick up the first fish and open its mouth and give it to them. Jesus made it clear. He was not supposed to give that. But he had to do it. And there were many things that the Lord Jesus had to endure through because of the sin that was sitting over all of the world and especially upon the house of Israel. Because the house of Israel was given the knowledge of sin. Not the rest of the nations of the world, at least at that time. They are not given that because we are told that the Torah is the one that points out the sin, that makes sin more sinful. And who got the Torah is the people of God. Right? But when the people try to keep the Torah as a righteousness, they try to keep the laws of Moses so that they can be righteous, Paul says, then you are seeking a righteousness that is not the righteousness of God because the righteousness of God is apart from even the Torah. 
It is Jesus Christ. So yes, the Torah points out your sin and the Torah is holy. Paul also says that the law is holy. But don't subject yourself under your thinking that by just observing the words of the Torah, you can obtain that righteousness. It is to point out your sin so that you will deal with it and so that you know that you need help and so that you would surrender your heart fully to God and God's righteousness will come in and the just shall live by faith. Abraham lived by faith in God. Right? So you know that God can deal with my sin problem which the Torah pointed out. And then help me to live out the wise instructions of the Torah, of the law that God has given as best as I can. But I fail here. If I fail here, yes, I've broken every law, but don't worry. Part of the process of learning is to take some falls, but you don't intentionally want to sin. And that's why in the sin offering, we are told, if anyone sins undeliberately, right? So in the family of God, God's expectation is that his children do not sin deliberately. You sin because maybe you are fearful or you don't know or you forgot. Or because you really, really, really are at the point where you are so vulnerable. But you are you are always broken before the Lord and you tell him. And that's why he gives a provision of the sin offering. Sin destroys perfect order. And so the sin offering pictures for us how to get back into that perfection of order. <clears throat> God can cover our sins. And that's why when we come together with all our weaknesses, we pray for one another. We release the forgiveness of sin. Jesus told the disciples, after he rose from the dead, he walked into the locked room in John 20, and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. Receive my holy breath. Receive the holy breath that I'm blowing. And he... <sighs> That's a very powerful signing act. And those ones who are measured within the most holy of holies, you can say, those band of disciples. Immediately Jesus said, peace, now receive this. And now you can go and bring peace to others. Whosoever sins that you forgive, they shall be forgiven in heaven. Now that is amazing sin offering at work. Not just in Jesus where he said, you are forgiven, go and sin no more. Now the disciples who are in that place could also speak that word could also break that sacrifice. So any time when we stand in a place, when a brother or sister comes to confess the sin to you, and you tell them your sins are forgiven, because you really walk in standing with God, and the Lord will allow you to speak that forgiveness into that person, you are offering service to whom? To God. You are breaking that sacrifice at the altar. Can you imagine this is one of the most neglected services at the church and that's why the church is so filled with resentment and bitterness and unforgiveness because we don't even know that this is what we have in Christ. And yes, if you st go and study you know, uh, Leviticus, you will find it listed in different categories, right? Uh, different weight of the sin, etc. So you have to revisit those um, earlier teaching on the covenant of Levi. Now, then we come to the... Okay, sorry. Come to the trespass offering or the guilt offering. The trespass offering, that is also, in fact, perhaps even more neglected. So if you remember what the trespass offering was, or the guilt offering, it refers to a sin that someone does that violates God and causes some loss to him, that violates brothers or sisters that cause some loss to them. And you have to make good. 
Now, the sin offering, the hatat that we talked about earlier, is a general one, right? A general thing that is not so specific. It's a condition of, of, of the, you know, but the trespass offering is a sin in which you have specifically brought some violence that caused some loss to God or to the people. And you have to make good whatever that loss. So you can say it's tacked on to the sin. It's part of that, but yet it is separate. So Jesus is called the trespass offering in Isaiah 53. And in many translations, it's translated into sin offering because the translators is thinking of these two as being connected or they are not aware of the distinctions. But the trespass offering, the guilt offering, is given specifically to make compensation and to bring restoration. Right? So, somebody, because of your mistake, lost $100, you give them $100 plus $20. Right? Right? Now, this is a very powerful show of love and compassion and mercy, responsible love. And some of the Christians of God, even in this place, you have shown that you're willing to not just help a person to come to a restoration, you want to even do more. That's serving God. That's a very powerful serving. And that's what Jesus is. He not only gave enough to die for everyone, he gave more. I give you life and abundant life. More and more and more and more. This is the, the much grace of God that Francis talked about. The much grace. There's already enough grace, but yet he gives you much, much, much more. You know, the, the, the great grace of God. And of course, the other offering is the peace offering. You can say the peace offering is the family offering. Because the priest and the worshiper who comes to it and God share in eating that meal. So the peace offering that is brought there have to be eaten, some within the day, some by the second day. Right? So it means that it's an ongoing, it's a fresh meal together, and the presence of God is there, and you are inheriting the presence of God in the peace offering. Peace on earth, goodwill to man, the angel announced at the birth of Jesus. And then, as Jesus comes as a full grown man to his destiny as the Lamb of God, he enters Jerusalem, peace in heaven. Right? Remember that? It's peace in heaven. Why? Because God wants the heavenly family, the family of God in heaven and on earth, to both have the inheritance of God. And that's peace. Peace is the inheritance of God. And so when we come truly and enjoy one another in all kinds of fellowship, whether it's the Holy Communion that we do every week or whether it's in the lunch as well that we have, we enjoy one another. We enjoy our goodness. So some who can cook very well, you, you would bring something that is very delicious for the rest of the body. So these are very actual physical ways that we bring that peace offering. We share, or you have a testimony to give, to encourage, or a lesson to bring, to instruct. You are participating in this offering where we are enjoying more and more of the inheritance of this family, the wealth and the goodness and the riches of this family. All right, let us arise. Our Father and our God, we ask in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one 
who had come that Moses foretold as a prophet that the people must listen to. We come and we listen to you, Lord Jesus. Even right now, we ask that you will even sign over us by breathing into us your words again and more of your presence again. And so that we truly will come into more and more of our inheritance, into real shalom that you want the house of Israel to have. Even before the cross, you sent the disciples out to bring shalom, to bring peace to every household that would receive the kingdom of God. Lord, you have called us Jam by name, by your name. And we now once again open our hearts before you. And Lord, continue to seal your words as part of that new covenant so that we truly are possessed by our Father more and more and more and instructed by your Spirit who will lead us into all truth. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In your holy name, Amen. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Oh, amen. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance before you and give you peace. Praise, love, and glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and evermore shall be, world without end. Amen.